Hello, and welcome to our class on the life of Moses, Lesson 21 on Numbers Chapter 20 on death and disappointment in Israel. We've been looking at the life of Moses over the course of this study, and so far we have had 20 lessons ranging from the birth of Moses to him being uh, called by God on Mount Sinai, going back, leading the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, receiving the law, the covenant on Mount Sinai, and then leading the people to the cusp of the promised land, and then seeing the nation rebel against Moses with the return of the 12 spies, 10 of those spies giving a negative report of the land. And then well, last week we looked at Korah's rebellion and God's institution or God's solidification of the Arianic high priesthood. And as we continue on with our study on the life of Moses, here in Lesson 21, we'll be staying in one chapter, Numbers chapter 20, and looking at the death and disappointment that takes place both in the life of Moses and in the nation of Israel. As we begin with Numbers chapter 20, in verse 1 we're told about the first death that we're going to encounter in this text, and that is the death of Miriam, the sister of Moses. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And that's all we have recorded about the death and the burial of Miriam, the sister of Moses. Now the wilderness of Zin was the southernmost part of Canaan, which connects to the wilderness of Paran, which is the northernmost part of of the Sinai Desert or Peninsula. Kadesh would have been their starting point to go into the Promised Land. Kadesh was also the starting point the previous time whenever Moses was there with Joshua and the nation of Israel when they sent out the 12 spies to spy out the land to give the best vantage point of attack 38 years earlier. And that is where the nation rebels against Moses and Aaron and God. And God punishes them with 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Here we are 38 years later after all this takes place and now once again they're on the cusp of going into the promised land. This is the new generation, the generation that God said your children are going to grow up and I'm going to lead them into the promised land. That generation are now adults and they're in the 40th year. They are getting ready to go into the promised land so once again the nation finds themselves at Kadesh. While there Miriam, the sister of Moses, dies. Interestingly, there is no record about the people mourning her death. Later on, we'll find out the nation will mourn the death of both Aaron and Moses for 30 days. But nothing is mentioned here about the mourning of Miriam, which is interesting. We don't know much about Miriam after she tries to usurp Moses' authority, and God gives her leprosy. Moses and Aaron plead on her behalf. God restores her skin to her after seven days of being unclean outside the camp. And not, we're not told very much about the life of Miriam, her status, her situation, but it is interesting here that she does survive the entire 40 year wandering and dies in the first month of the 40th year. This would place her to be at least about 125 years old, maybe even a little bit older. But once again, the people of Israel are not mentioned to have mourned her, although she is an extremely important figure in the life of Moses and in the nation of Israel itself. In the life of Moses, Miriam helps to save Moses' life. She watches to make sure that Moses, baby Moses, in the basket is safe whenever the daughter of Pharaoh picks up Moses in the basket. Miriam is the one that introduces the daughter of Pharaoh to her mother, uh, Jacobet, who is going to be the nurse of Moses. She also serves as a prophetess for Israel. She leads the Israelite women in the Song of Deliverance. And in Micah chapter 6, verse 4, she is mentioned with Moses and Aaron as the leaders of the nation of Israel. And so, a very important figure, and yet her death is relegated only to one verse, and not much information is given to us about the death, burial, or mourning of Miriam, the sister of Moses. And then we get to one of the most interesting passages of the Bible, certainly one of the most interesting passages of the life of Moses. And that is what is going to take place in, Mo in uh, here in Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through 13. Numbers 20, 2 through 13. 
Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we would have perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt and bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from the Lord as he commanded him. Now, let's stop right there just for a second. Moses and Aaron fall on their face before the Lord. We see that Moses and Aaron do this many times whenever the nation rebels against them or against God as a sign of repentance for the people, but also as a sign of humility before God, saying, Lord, what do you want us to do with this people in this situation? God is rather kind compared to some of his responses previously, but this is a new generation. And it's been 38 years since we have had a record of the nation rebelling against Moses. All those rebellions that we have talked about that took place so many times in the book of Exodus and in Numbers was all done by one generation in the time frame of two years. We've been relatively quiet for the last 38 years. And so now we get to this situation and God seems to be gracious with this new generation of Israel. Now it seems like this is being led by some of the remnant, the older generation of those who have been condemned to die in the wilderness. And they say, we have no water to drink. Which is interesting because we were told that Kaddish was a good place for water. In fact, it had three oases. Now, one of the reasons why there is no water perhaps is because you have a rather large nation of well over a million people and all their livestock taking up the resources in that region. But Israel staying there for an extended period of time, they may have drank up all the water supply. It's very possible. So now the nation of Israel is turning against Moses and against Aaron and saying, there's no water for us to drink. We're going to die. We should have died years ago with our brothers before the Lord. Possibly talking about the rebellion of Korah. And they say, what good is it for us to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and to die? We could have died years ago and not had to go through all this. And so they're very upset. And so Moses and Aaron fall before the tent of meeting. Say, Lord, what do you want us to do? And God tells Moses to assemble the nation before the rock. And that to take his staff and to go and to speak to the rock. And it will yield forth its water. Now let's see what Moses does in verses 10 through 13. Now Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And Moses said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, Because you do not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. And so here we have the story of Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock. A very sad thing indeed. Moses said, Shall we bring water to you out of this rock? Was Moses elevating himself in Aaron? and their role in bringing water to the people. From God's response to Moses, it certainly seems that that is the case, that Moses elevated the status of himself and Aaron and their role in bringing water and provisions to the people. Perhaps Moses had felt attacked. We're told in the text that the entire nation grumbled against Moses and against Aaron. And so perhaps Moses, feeling personally attacked, decides in this moment to show them that he is the reason as to why 
they have not been destroyed by God. Interestingly enough, there may be some truth to that because Moses has interceded for the people on numerous occasions when God was trying to kill them or to said that he was going to kill them because of their disobedience and their irreverence before him. And so perhaps time and responsibility has gotten to Moses and in his own mind he has elevated his situation and his role with the nation of Israel. Moses forgot that he was a servant of God and that God could perform these miracles with or without Moses and with anyone that he had chose to be his representative. That danger is alive and well in all of God's people today inside the kingdom. If Moses, such a great and wonderful man, such a tremendous leader and friend of God, whom God spoke face to face with as a friend, was able to succumb to this type of temptation, this is a grave warning for us all. Now many have asked, what was the sin of Moses? Well, there are two here that are mentioned in the text. The first of which is Moses' disobedience or his disbelief. God plainly told Moses to speak to the rock. Now earlier, when they went to another Meribah in Exodus 17, Moses was told to strike the rock, and Moses did. But here God tells Moses to assemble the congregation before the rock, and for Moses to take the staff with him, but for Moses to speak to the rock. Very plain instructions. And so many times we have seen throughout the life of Moses that God gives Moses a list of things to do, and time and time again, whether we're talking about relaying the law to the people, whether we're talking about the construction of the tabernacle, whether we're talking about the sacrifices or the dedication of the tabernacle, every time we're told, and Moses did all that the Lord commanded. But that is not what it says here in this case. Here, Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, strikes the rock which is a sign of both disobedience and disbelief. Disobedience because God explicitly told Moses what he wanted to be done, and Moses did not explicitly carry those orders out. He did something different, which is a sign of, of disobedience. Now, God always connects in the Bible disobedience with disbelief. Because if you believe that God means what he says, you believe that's how God wants it to be done, then you're going to obey that command. If you disobey, it is because you disbelieved. The writer of Hebrews also makes this connection when talking about the nation of Israel. He says in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 that that nation did not enter the promised land because of their disbelief. Now, you see that they disobeyed God time and time again. The writer of Hebrews says that disobedience is connected to disbelief. You cannot say that you believe God and disobey Him. Because your disobedience is a sign of your disbelief. If God says, do not do this because it is bad for you, and then you do it, then you don't believe God's warning because you have decided in and of yourself that it is going to be okay. And so here we see that Moses disbelieved and disobeyed God. The second thing that we're told that Moses did that was a sin against God is that he did not hold God up to be holy in the sight of the people. Moses pointed the attention to himself and to Aaron and did not point the attention or the glory to God. It's important for us is whenever we accomplish things in our life, whenever people are praising us, it's important for us to remember that we are to glorify God in all things. That it's important for us to give Him the glory. And so we need to not have a Nebuchadnezzar moment and to walk around and to say, look at what I have done, look at what I have built, look at all the things that I have been able to overcome. And those are not situations in life where we need to elevate ourselves or try to glorify ourselves in the eyes of others. And those are times whenever we need to glorify God. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to be people who are zealous for good works. That's what it says in Titus chapter 2. That God gave us His grace and redeemed us, that He would have a people who were zealous for good works. Oftentimes, Christians express a fear of doing good works in public because they don't want to elevate themselves. That's, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God wants you to do good works, that He wants you to be zealous for good works, and He wants those works to be done before men. But Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount that the purpose for us doing those good works for men is so that we 
might point and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Those works are not to be done in public to glorify ourselves. Those works are to be done in public and to be seen by others so that we may point the glory to God. Moses didn't do that in the situation, but instead pointed glory to himself. And God tells Moses and Aaron that because of their actions here at the rock, that they will not be allowed to enter the promised land with the nation of Israel. They too will die in the wilderness before they get to the land of promise, just like the generation of those who had rebelled against God in other ways. Now the waters did come forth from the rock and did water the people and their livestock, very similar to the waters of Meribah in a different location recorded in Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 as the people had made it out of the Red Sea and were on their way to Mount Sinai. Now there are interesting correlations between that Meribah and this Meribah. Obviously the rock situation that we've already discussed with Moses striking both rocks the first incident, Moses doing what God had commanded. The second incident, God disobeying what God had commanded. But the nation of Israel grumbles against God in Exodus 17 as they're coming out of Egypt and on the cusp of becoming the nation of Israel, God's people, and receiving the law. Here we also see that the nation of Israel is at a transitional phase. They're transitioning out of the wilderness and into the land of Canaan. This is a new generation new people. And so there are lots of, of similarities between Exodus 17 and Numbers chapter 20 and the two waters of Meribah. And then we see what takes place in verses 14 through 21. And that is going to be Edom denying Israel access to the waters of its territory. And so let's go ahead and let's read that together. Exodus, excuse me, Let's go ahead and read that together. Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And we cried to the Lord. He heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please, let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out against you with sword. And the people of Israel said to him, we will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But Edom said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. Israel was on its way to the promised land, the land of Canaan, and they're on the edge of Edom. It would be much easier and faster for the nation of Israel to be able to go up the king's highway. This was a very important and popular trading route between Damascus and with Arabia that went on down even into Egypt. And so we see here that this is a very well established trade route. It would have been the easiest and fastest way for Israel to get from the wilderness of Zin up to the promised land. So they make an appeal to their kinsmen the nation of Edom. Now, when Israel sends its courier or its messenger to the nation of Edom, it says, first of all, your brother Israel. Now, remember that Edom and Israel have a connection. They are both the descendants of Abraham and Isaac through Isaac's twin sons, Israel being the descendants of Jacob or Israel, and Edom being the descendants of Esau. And so both nations have a common ancestor. And so Israel believes that if it extends its hand in friendship and kinsmanship with Edom, that they will be kind and generous to them. And the nation of Israel has a very kind and courteous offer. They say, look, we're not going to go into any of your territorial land. We're not going to 
we're not going to go into any of your vineyards, your farms, your fields, your wells. We're not going to take anything of yours that cannot be replenished. We're going to go up the King's Highway. It's already an established route. It'll be the fastest and quickest way for us to get out of your territory and get to the land in which we are going. We won't take anything from you. The only water that we're going to require, we will carry ourselves and our vessels, or we will drink out of flowing rivers and streams, which means that it will not be anything from you that cannot be replenished by nature itself. And so please let us go. And Edom gives a very antagonistic and harsh offer that a first-time reader of the Pentateuch I don't think would be expecting for Edom to give because it is so egregious. And Edom says, if you go into our territory, we will meet you with swords. And Israel says, please, please, uh, it will go through your land. We won't eat any of your food. And we'll even pay for the water that we will drink out of the streams and rivers which is, even in the ancient world, that's an extremely generous offer um, for them to be willing to pay for even the water they drink out of the rivers and streams and creeks. And Edom then sends an army on its border to make sure that Israel does not enter. A terribly egregious act by the nation of Edom. God will condemn them for it generations later throughout the Bible whenever prophets like Obadiah give their woes to the nations around Israel, and it gives its woe to Edom. Edom and Israel will continue to have an antagonistic relationship throughout their existence, and eventually Edom will be destroyed. This also highlights the fact that Israel was not a warlike nation. Israel could have responded with a military action against Edom because of their refusal to allow Israel to pass. God was probably being gracious and generous to the descendants of Abraham through Esau by not commissioning such an attack against Edom. Also, we see that Israel was not very warlike. The spies go out, come back and say, we can't fight against the nations of Canaan. They're on the cusp of Edom and they get afraid by the nation, the national, the national army of Edom. Then God sends them into the land of Canaan and tells them to destroy and drive the inhabitants out, and they don't even fulfill that command by God. So Israel was never really a very successful military people, even in situations where God sanctioned, authorized, and commanded them to fight. And so we see that again take place here with Edom. And then we have another death that is going to be recorded in Numbers chapter 20, and that is the death of Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses. And so let's read about that incident in Numbers chapter 20, verses 22 through 29. And they journeyed from Kadesh, and the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Hor. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor, on the border of the land of Edom, Let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given the people of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar the son of him and bring them up to the Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. And they went up on Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron and his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron had perished, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron thirty days. And so here we have God's command. God has already told Aaron and Moses that they are going to die before entering into the promised land because of their disobedience at the waters of Meribah. And so the people of Israel leave Kadesh and they get to Mount Hor, which we don't know the exact location, but many people believe today that it is Jabel Madura, uh, which is about 15 miles north of Kadesh. And so the nation of Israel is here at Mount Hor, and God tells Moses to tell Aaron that his time has come. Imagine being told by God that you're going to die in a very short time. And so God tells Moses what is to be done, and that's what Moses does. Moses has learned his lesson previously from Mount Merib from uh, the waters of Meribah, and we see Moses once again fulfill all that God commanded him to do. 
So the nation of Israel is assembled together there at Mount Hor, and they are to watch one of the most significant events that will take place in a nation's history, in the nation of Israel, and that is the passing of one high priesthood to another high priest. The high priest was to be a descendant of Aaron, and it was a lifelong appointment, and it was an extremely important position because the high priest was the intercessor between the nation of Israel and God himself. And so the spiritual health of the nation was dependent in some ways upon who the high priest was. And this is the first transition that has ever taken place from high priest to high priest. And so God takes Aaron and his son Eliezer up on the mountain before the eyes of the entire nation. And he takes the garments off of Aaron and puts them on to Eliezer. A symbolic event of the passage of the high priesthood from Aaron to his son. But it's also a reminder that these garments are holy. And that they are to never touch a dead body. And so it is necessary for these emblems and these garments to be taken off of Aaron before he dies and passed on to Eliezer. And after that takes place, Aaron dies. And Moses and Eliezer come down off the mountain, and the nation of Israel sees what has taken place, and they mourn Aaron for 30 days. Now, we are told this takes place on the first day of the fifth month of the 40th year. That's in Numbers chapter 33, verses 38 through 39. This would put Miriam's death in the first month exactly four months previous. She died on the first day of the first month, and Aaron died on the first day of the fifth month. And so Aaron would have been 123 years old. That is how we know the time frame and the date of Miriam's death and also how old she would have been roughly. The typical time frame of mourning was seven days. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 tells us that. Also, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 12. A 30-day mourning period was reserved only for special people and special circumstances. Moses would also receive a 30-day mourning from the people in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 8. And so here in Numbers chapter 20, we see death and disappointment. We see the death of Miriam, the death of Aaron the foretold death of Moses before he reaches the promised land, and also the disappointment of the nation of Israel as they once again rebel against their leaders, Moses and Aaron. They rebel against God and his leadership. And so really, Numbers chapter 20 really is a, a disappointing chapter, if you will, for the health, the spiritual health of the nation of Israel and also the incident of Moses and Aaron at the waters of Meribah. And despite the fact that this is a disappointing chapter, there is a lot for us to take away for our lives today. And so what are some of those takeaways as we conclude this lesson, Lesson 21, on death and disappointment? Well, the first takeaway that we have is that sin produces death. This has always been true. James tells us that when Sin has been conceived and brought forth in its fullness and brings forth death, James 1, 15. The Bible also tells us that sin has plagued mankind ever since Adam in the garden, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. And sin brought forth physical death. God told Adam that when he ate of the fruit that he would surely die. Talking about the entrance of sin into the world and to the lives of mankind, which is going to bring forth death. Now, thankfully for us, Christ Jesus has conquered sin and death. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, that because Jesus has conquered sin and death through his death, burial, and resurrection, that you and I have the hope and the promise of being victorious over sin and death if. We are Christians living faithfully in Christ Jesus, that Christ's blood continues to cleanse us from sin, and that we can anticipate the resurrection from the dead and victory over sin. What an important takeaway for us to remember as we look at the consequences of sin and it bringing forth death, both in the nation of Israel, but also in the lives of leaders like Moses and Aaron.
The second takeaway or conclusion that I think with multiple subpoints is learning from Moses' sin. This is one of the most well-known incidents in the Bible. The fact that Moses sinned against God and his explicit orders at Kadesh at the waters of Meribah, and because of Moses' disobedience, it calls this wonderful man of God, this courageous leader who had spoken with God face to face as if God was speaking to a friend, the man that beheld the, the glory of God, the man that interceded for the nation of Israel time and time of again, again seemingly changing God's mind and his destruction of the nation of Israel entirely. This man and his sin which caused him not being able to enter into the promised land. It breaks your heart because you feel for Moses, this man who had to endure so much as he led God's people for 40 years, and this one incident causes him not to enter into the physical promised land of Canaan. What can we learn from that? Well, there are certain, several things. Number one, that we must obey God exactly. Jesus is the provider of salvation to all those who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Samuel told Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. In John chapter 4, verse 24, we're told that God is seeking worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. That truth being an indicator of obedience. Also, spirit is an indicator of obedience. Matthew chapter 15. Verses 8 and 9, right? That spirit, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, teaching for themselves the doctrines and the commandments of men. So even the spirit, the heart, is connected to obedience. And so we must learn, if we're going to be the people of God, if we're going to be those who serve God, who listen to God, then we're going to be people who obey God and who obey Him exactly in everything that He has prescribed that we are to do. God takes obedience to Him very seriously and we need to obey God exactly the way He has told us that we need to do. The second thing that we can learn from the sin of Moses is to honor God in everything. That we are to give God the glory in everything that we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 or Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21. We live in a world where people are constantly seeking to glorify themselves in the eyes of others. This has always been the case, but I truly believe that with the prevalence of social media and that the desire that we have for likes and views, that this temptation has been heightened in our society. This desire to be beholden and to be glorified in the eyes of man for who we are, for what we look like, for what we have done, for where we are at in life. I think this is a serious temptation for all of us. And if this was able to get the, the man of Moses, the friend of God, then we need to take this temptation very seriously. Because all of us, and I will be the first to admit that I have many times given in to this temptation of seeking vain glory for myself, Having those Nebuchadnezzar moments. Look at what I have done. I wonder what people think about me in this situation. I wonder if people saw that thing that I did or that, that place I was able to speak at. And so the idea of glorifying ourselves in the eyes of others is a very real temptation for not only Moses, but for all the people of God. And we must realize that everything that we do is to bring honor and glory not to ourselves, but to God. And really, at the end of the day, everything that you do is, emo is motivated by the desire to bring honor and glory to somebody. Everything that you do that's going to be seen by others, it is done to bring honor and glory to somebody. The question is, is the motivation to bring honor and glory to yourself, or is the motivation to bring honor and glory to God? And really, at the end of the day, that is the question. And really, at the end of the day, that is the question that we have to answer. We must do good things. Titus 2, 11 through 14, 
Jesus and his words from the is very clear that we are to do good things. Galatians chapter 6, you go on and on. The Bible commands that we do good things and for people to see those good things. But it also commands us to do those good things so that people will see those things and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And if people glorify us and pay honor and homage to us, then it is necessary for us to take that honor and glory and immediately redirect that honor and glory to God and give Him all glory, honor, and praise. The third thing that we need to learn from Moses' sin is that we need to realize that even godly people sin and make mistakes. No one is perfect. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Even a great man, a godly man, a friend of God like Moses. All the years of service and all the wonderful acts of faithfulness and obedience did not make Moses immune to sin and we are not immune to sin. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how strong you are as a Christian, no matter how many people you have brought to Christ, how many wonderful things that you have done, and then immediately given the glory to God, we are not immune to sin. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, to take heed lest we fall. Temptation is always crouching at the door. Just as God told Cain, in Genesis, I believe, chapter 3, maybe chapter 4, that sin is crouching at the door, and this desire is to have you. Satan is crouching at the door of your life, and he is waiting for any chance for you to open up that door and allow him in. Take heed lest we fall. Even good people sin, and we are not immune to sin. Now Moses did not enter the physical promised land of Canaan. But he did enter into the promised spiritual land of rest. And we know that from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. When Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he is met there in Matthew with Moses and Elijah. These are the lawgiver, the prophets of God. Moses had to deal with the consequences of sin in his life. And whenever we sin, we will have to deal with the consequences in this life. And sometimes, even after we have repented of a sin, we still have to live with the consequences. Someone commits a crime and they're in prison, and they have a Bible study and they are baptized, are their sins washed away? Absolutely. Are they free from the guilt of those sins spiritually in the eyes of God? Absolutely. Are they going to be immediately released from prison? No, because there are still physical consequences of sin. And Moses had to live with those consequences, but the spiritual ramifications of those sins were forgiven. The same is true for you and I today. We will sin, and God will forgive us if we are faithful and we are penitent. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7-9 through 9 tells us that Clearly, that if we say we have no sin, we make him to be a liar. But if we are faithful, we confess our sins. He is just and faithful to forgive our sins. Because, verse 7, the blood of Christ Jesus continually cleanses us and forgives us of those sins if we are walking in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we will sin, but God's love, His mercy, his forgiveness is available to us if we are penitent and if we are in Christ Jesus walking faithfully each and every day. So we must take heed lest we fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. But we can also take comfort in knowing that because of the blood of Christ Jesus that we have the ability to be forgiven. And that should give us comfort. That yes, Moses sinned. And yes, Moses had to deal with the consequences of those sins. But Moses' salvation was secure because he repented and continued to live his life in the service of God, living faithfully and obeying, just like later Numbers 20, 
all that God commanded him to do. And as Christians, it's important for us to strive to learn from the lessons here in Numbers chapter 20 and learn from the sin of Moses. For us to obey God exactly, to honor God in everything, and to realize that godly people sin and make mistakes, but there is forgiveness and salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. I appreciate you taking the time to study with me Numbers chapter 20, and I'm looking forward to our study next week. Lesson 22 will be on the defeats and victories of the nation of Israel. And we'll be talking about some of the military victories and defeats the nation of Israel incurs on its way to the promised land of Canaan. Thank you so much for studying the Bible with me. I hope that you and your family are safe and well during this time of coronavirus uh, isolation. I'm looking forward to the day where you and I can study the Bible together in person. I miss your questions. I miss your comments. I miss seeing your beautiful faces and looking forward to the day soon, I hope, that we can be together again. Thank you so much, and may God continue to bless you.